All right, guys, let's get down deep into the weeds of some of the innovations that are occurring with Plan Mecca. I think you're going to be completely blown away with what's going on. On the surface, it's hard to really know all the innovations that are occurring unless you have somebody kind of explain it to you. So let's go into it a little bit. The first thing new is the Plan Mecca Emerald S. The S is fresh onto the market right now. It looks nearly identical in every single way to the Emerald, but the Emerald was a phenomenal quadrant scanner. It was inexpensive, five-year warranty, ultra lightweight. What they did is they took that form factor that everybody really loved and they supercharged it. So it's three times as fast. It's got 20% larger field of view without actually increasing the tip size. They've got a new laser mechanism, a new ultra high definition sensor, color matching. Um, literally this scanner has turned into the best full art scanner on the market, I think. If you, especially if you consider the size and the weight of it and how open it is. So we're gonna get into this kind of today and we're gonna go through some things. But with that said though, if you look at all the other scanners on the market, and I, I definitely love um, where we're going in, in this profession with digital. They're phenomenal scanners. It's actually hard to really differentiate them. They all do really, really crisp color, full arch scanning well, um, rotational based scanning. All of them have some form of one another of artificial intelligence, soft tissue removal. The Emerald S has what they called active delete. It's so powerful, guys. Anything that you accidentally scan is automatically removed. Um, so cool. They're, they keep improving on it too as well. Like, like that tissue right there over that uh, buckle on that tooth just melted away instantly. Um, no need for retractors when you scan anymore. In addition, it has basically one of the deepest fields of view of any scanner. So it's 20 millimeters deep going all the way down to this pallet here. This palatal vault is one of the deepest pallets that you're going to find. Even the Trios 3 up there is just struggling a tiny bit to pick up that deep pallet. The Emerald S just flies through that. What a phenomenal scanner. I think though, if you look what makes it truly unique, like it, for me, it's just the whole ecosystem of Plan Mecca. This is not sped up here. This is a real-time scan. This is with beta software. They've actually increased the speed dramatically even from this video. Look at the size of that color sensor, guys. It's huge. It's able to capture so much data so fast and it never seems to get lost like some other scanners out there. It's, it's really phenomenal, the, the stitching algorithms that they've used and updated with this scanner. In fact, Plamec is always innovating in this area. They're coming out with a uh, software version coming up uh, that dramatically increases the accuracy of the scanner, even to where it was a few weeks ago, because they're always innovating. It's just phenomenal. So look at how crisp that 30, 30 second or so scan was. The actual scanner itself is like a mouse. So you just rotate the scanner in your hand and you're able to do hands-free manipulation of the model. You could zoom in and out by bringing the camera closer to your body. Instant an automatic high definition photo is anywhere you want. As you're 3D scanning, you just pause for a second and it's gonna capture a high definition photo, goes right into the record. That photo is also instantly put on the color file. So now the laboratory can see the same exact thing that you're seeing because it's an open ply color export, unlike 3Shape where you need that color, you're gonna to have to have a 3Shape system to see the color. So here we could see that we don't even need retraction cord anymore. Like in this instance, we're just relying on the differentiation of the tooth and the tissue. And, and whereas physical impressions, you need that separation of um, tissue and tooth so that you could get that material in there. With this, we're able to use color and high definition color at that to distinguish the two. But just in case you were worried, you could hit a button and ditch your dyes instantly so the laboratory actually gets this ditched dye. So there's no communication issues. That huge sensor with that epically deep depth of field makes soft tissue tracking phenomenally easy. 30 seconds to a minute, no problem with complete arch scans. New bite stitching algorithm that they've been working on to make it really accurate. That bite just snaps in. Um, very little to zero occlusal adjustments needed at all when you do this system like this. With they just spend they spend so much time tweaking these things, making it better. It's, it's become, I think, the best system in the world, especially when you consider everything that it could do. You know, if you're just going to use it as a scanner, I think it wins hands down. But if you use it for the other things that we're going to go in today, beautiful. Shade matching. Nothing, you, you don't have to calibrate it. 
the trios, you have to calibrate it like 850 times a day. Every time you scan, you have to calibrate that thing. No calibration needed with this. It's in intrinsically built in. Near infrared transillumination pending FDA. Snap on an inexpensive tip. You're going to be able to detect those uh, interproximal caries. Um, what a phenomenal tool without having the need, the need for any kind of radiation to detect interproximal caries now. And of course, being Plameca, you have to have fun with color. I love the option to put different colors on, as silly as that seems. Um, I just think it's really cool. Now, the biggest, I think, feature of this scanner that gets completely and utterly forgotten is that it is the most plug-and-play system ever. What does that mean? Well, Planmeca gives you nearly as many Romexis licenses as you want, but you cannot load more than two co-committantly. So you can't have more than two open at the same time, but you could have 20 loaded on all your systems that you want. And if you want to load more than two at the same time, you just could buy another license. But what this means is that literally I could have desktops, laptops, all my office computers that meet the minimum specifications required by Planmeca for to run this stuff you could have it in every op, and because it's networkable, basically I could scan an operatory one, go to operatory three. That information that I scan in op one is instantly and automatically available in operatory three, ready to go. Same thing with CBCTs. If, uh, if I have a Promax and I'm scanning in Romexis, that CBCT, even if it's at office site number one and I'm at office, another office, it's instantly and automatically available in room access at the other office. It's all networked. It's all synergistically loaded together. It's all instantly available quickly and ready to go. That is phenomenal, guys. Basically, you unplug the camera because it's a USB camera, not a proprietary connection, and you go, and there's no, like, you know, other systems, they have, like, 500 cords hanging out. It looks like an octopus that you have to plug in six different things. This is literally just a USB with a USB-C. So just go system to system to system all day long, every day, plug and play, super powerful. Nobody even talks about that kind of stuff. Now, it's completely open. What does that mean? Well, everybody else is slightly open. Yeah, you might be able to get an STL out of your CIRAC, but you can't actually export the crowns that you design. You have to send them to a dense supply serona mill. You can't actually send them anywhere else. So like, forget about collaborating with laboratories. You can't import designs. This system is the only system that I know chairside that lets you freely import and export meshes, designs, OBJs, plies, STLs. So for example, why is that important? Well, let's say that I am working on a big case. It's a big, maybe eight unit veneer case. And I don't want to spend the time to design them on my system. I could send those STL files to the lab. They could design them and shoot me back the design files that I could mill in office. That's really powerful. That's a new way to communicate to the lab. That's a new collaboration method. Or let's say that you have, um, maybe you want to be able to import a core file from an abutment design manufacturer and you could import that abutment file and design your crown, or you could import the actual crown design. We'll talk about that later and mill that in-house to save a ton of money. So basically, let's go back to the scanner. There's three tips. There's the near-infrared transillumination tip pending FDA. There is the regular standard size tip, and then there is this slimline tip. This thing is tiny. It's micro. Now, why is that impressive? Well, everybody would come out with tiny tips if tiny tips were easy, but it's not easy. The mathematics and the development and the R&D that go into the small tips will blow you away. The tips are smart tips. They're heated. They keep track of how long you're scanning. They keep track of um, the amount of time that the scanner has been on. They are very, very smart. They know when they've been autoclaved, so you're ready to go. This small tip, though, will blow your mind. The standard tip is about the same size as, say, a three-shaped trios tip. Okay, it's a good kind of standard tip size. The small tip, though, is phenomenal. This thing is like, just slides anywhere that you want it to go. It is the smallest autoclavable tip on the market. Let's see how it scans. This thing, like I said, is about half the size of the trios tip. It's the size of your finger. 
It's so cool. So let's look at this thing. This is real-time scan speed with the with the um, slimline tip, they call it. This thing just flies. It never gets lost. So um, before scanning with it, it's just, this I know people that only have this tip. The patients you don't have to stay open so big and so long. It's literally like one-fifth the size of the prime scan tip. One-fifth. One dash five. It's tiny. Okay, and it scans just as fast. So what's the point of spending an extra thirty thousand dollars on a scan? You could get. I think this is the best scan on the market right now. It's, it's because it looks funny is that if you look at it, you have to look at it up to date because they're so innovative in what they do. The software has completely been rejuvenated and renewed. It looks similar because they like to have it to where it looks and feels the same so people don't have to relearn how to use it, but the, it's completely and utterly changed from the coding perspective. The models are so crisp. It doesn't matter where you scan anymore. You could scan uh, any direction and it's going to create a perfect model. It's not scan pattern dependent anymore. So, you know, as always, zero fees with the, um, the Emerald. So the Emerald S, five years, warranty. Some of these scanners guys are charging over four grand a year just to turn them on, like the iTero Element, over $4,000 a year just to play. That's insane. Serac is $299 a month. That's over three grand a year just to play. With Planmeca, it's zero fees with five-year warranty. So if then if you were to break it out of five-year cost of ownership, it's the cheapest scanner on the market. Okay, so it even beats the Meta, which is like 20 grand plus the computer, so you're at 23, 24. Um, and then it has like a one-year warranty. So if you would compare the Emerald S, it's the best thing going for a five-year cost of ownership right now. Accuracy. I think people get too deep into accuracy. Here's my research team. They're all smarter and better than me. Ludlow there in the striped shirt, Prostodonis, amazing guy. Dr. Minito there in the blue. That guy is a director of digital dentistry. He's a expert clinician and then Dr. Evans, DMD, PhD, periodontist there in the black scrubs all the way to the right. This dude's on a whole nother level when it comes to intelligence. But we look at the stuff, look at how far we've come over the years, guys. I mean, look at how fast we're scanning these compared to, this is me scanning um, with my E4D and Serac over 10 years ago. We are so lucky to be where we are today in this profession. I'm so excited to be a dentist now. Ultra low dose, full jaw scan, 18 microsieverts, being able to do terminal hinge access and measure condylar inclination and do dynamic articulation. What? You don't even need a face pose anymore, guys. We're, ma we're, we're, we're mounting in centric relation and verifying that using CBCT, irradiating the patients. <laughs> Think about this, guys. The average full mouth series is 40 microsieverts. I could do a 400 micron full jaw skull scan at about 18 microsieverts. That's that's insane using Plymeca's ultra low dose technology. Um, we'll get into that maybe a little bit later, but they have the best ultra low dose in the business without actually decreasing um, quality. A lot of people have ULD ultra low dose, but it's not really ultra low dose, and the quality goes way down to where you can't even see anything. So, best CBCTs on planet Earth. Pair it with the Emerald S. I think we're golden. I should know. I have about $3.4 million worth of stuff available at my fingertips. Phenomenal scanners out there, guys. I'm not here to knock anybody's scanner. Um, can't really go wrong investing in digital technology in general today. But okay, now let's talk about this though. This is a this is a troubling statistic. In 2018, only 16%, 16% of dentists had scanners in their office. Whew. That makes me sad. I don't know what to say. I mean, laboratories were at 90%. So our colleagues on the lab side are just begging digital. And here we are, dentists are saying, we don't want to do digital yet. You know what? That is fastly changing. If you look at 2020, we're at 20%. Um, by the time we hit 2020 this year, we're going to be at over 20%. That's we're annualizing 5 to 10% growth each year. This is the fastest growing segment right now in dentistry is um, just digital impressions. I think, though, I think one reason why we haven't adopted it as fast as maybe I, I had predicted is that we're just kind of burnt out from hearing the same message, right? We're over-repped. So you get a rep in and, and they're like, hey, you want to calculate ROIs on some stuff? And we're like, you know. No, God, God. No, God, please, no, 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 no. no. 
No! 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 We're over it. We're, we've heard it so many times. Then we have these ridiculous nightmares of powdering our patients' faces and, you know, the $300 bottle of powder. That's one penny worth of powder that the company found the need to charge us so much for to stab us in the side and twist it, right? So, I mean, we're away from all that now. We're, we're completely to a different world right now. In fact, with Planmeca, at least, we don't have to worry about being nickel and dime. So if you think about it, the average office spend about $4,300 a year on impression material. So you would think you would be excited to get a scanner and say, okay, well, I don't have to buy impression material anymore, right? So what do companies do? They're like, yeah, that's, that's cool, but we're gonna charge you $4,300 a year to use our scanner because we can, right? Well, you know what? Things are kind of changing. People are a little bit tired of being nickel and dimed. Um, with Climeca, you don't have any fees associated with it. I think just just nurture that a little bit. Five years, all included, is the most inexpensive scanner out there. I think it's the best, even for any price. So let's talk a little bit about openness. We talked about we talked about the ability to design and why you need to export those designs out. There is a real ROI lurking underneath this equation right here. Check this out. You got a scanner. It's not a huge ROI. You're still scanning and sending to the laboratory. The laboratory might give you what, like a $10 discount. So instead of $100 a crown, you're paying 90, let's pretend. Um, goodness gracious, it's usually a lot more than that where I'm sending my stuff to. But the real ROI comes in for this with me. Get your scanner and you get some design software. The design software is not a lot of money. Learn how to design your own crowns, okay? Send your designs to the laboratory. Let the laboratory or milling center mill just your design. So now you're not paying a lab to design for you. So what happens is your lab bill goes from like say 100 down to 30. So you could go to zirconiamilling.com, which is phenomenal. You could go to Alien Milling, which is just a milling center. 28 bucks for full contour zirconia restoration. You can't mill it in house for less. Okay, we're gonna talk about in-office milling because it's a service to the patient, it's a time saver. That's where you make up your money there. But for here, this is phenomenal, guys. Five minutes to design a crown. It's your crown. You put the proximal contacts where you wanted it. You put the occlusion where you wanted it. It took you three to five minutes to design it. You pump that out to the milling center. And for 28 bucks, you're popping in that crown. You can't beat that. Now, you can't do that with a Surac. See, Surac systems do not let you export your designs. You could only mill them with a eh, dense ply thrown a mill. So, I don't know, I guess you could buy in-lab software for a gajillion dollars and send it to that and then export the STL in a roundabout way for giggles, but nobody's gonna do that. Why would you spend money on in-lab software? Oh, I forgot. It's because you you like spending money on dense ply Serona stuff. But anyway, so this is the first one that I did with the Plan Mecha system way 10 years ago, guys. This is ridiculously long time ago, but it's back when we had like three Y zirconia. That was that like super opaque, but super strong zirconia. I was so excited when I did this because you can't mill zirconia in office for less. Okay. It's a pain in the neck to mill zirconia in office. You got to get fancy sintering ovens and whatever. Just send it out. It's phenomenal. Oh, here we go. Here's the design. Look at how easy it is pretty much done. Um, the software is so powerful. I'm going to actually show you the same design and in a little bit so you can see the occlusion and proximal contacts, how easy it is. But basically that STL just gets pumped out to the lab. But who do, if you think about it, who does that really benefit? That $28 full contour zirconia crown that you designed, that you sent off, does it benefit the patient? Well, not really because you're not going to lower your fees to transfer that cost savings onto the patient probably, but it really benefits you as the clinician and that's fine. That's the definition of a business, right? But you're providing a quality product to your patient for, for more profitability on your end, right? So you could keep your lights on and pay your staff and your overhead, which is astronomical, right? Um, justify the cost for the cool equipment. We're gonna talk about chair side milling and that's all about the patient.
that benefits the patient in every aspect. But let's just focus a little bit first on digital impression systems because <laughs> I think digital impressions benefit the patient profoundly. People don't realize that. The clinician says, I'm going to get a scanner for, for me. I want to scan with it. I want whatever you want out of it. But the reality of it is we don't get scanners for us. We get scanners for the patient. Here's why. What do these guys care about? What do our patients really care about? Well, guys, it's terrifying to go to the dentist. And impressions are a part of that equation. It's not a, it's not a calculus problem that we need to solve together. It's not, we're not doing advanced physics here. This is terrifying. A giant tray being pumped into your mouth with rubber that tastes nasty, that has to sit there for three to five terrifying minutes, all while you're praying that this thing is accurate enough that you don't have to redo it, right? So you literally, when you pop it out of the patient's mouth, you hold it down there, you squint really small, right? Because you think if you squint, it's gonna fix all the errors of the impression. You pump, pump it in a box and send it off. Scanning is just a, just a different pressure level for the patient. It's relaxed. You could stop at any time. They hardly even know what you're doing. They think you're in there taking a photo or something. Next thing you know, their whole face pops up on the screen in 3D. It's phenomenal. If you look at the research, they would tend to agree. This is a pretty, pretty phenomenal study that shows that patients hate these two things the most. Anesthesia, which, yeah, no duh, and impressions. And they actually hate them almost the same. We can fundamentally get rid of impressions as we know it right now for not a lot of money. Why don't we do that? Why are we still taking physical impressions? Why don't we offer something for our patients that are going to blow their minds, okay? We can get rid of this whole stress factor. Let's go down this rabbit hole of physical impressions. Let's see what patients really think about it because all you have to do is go on social media and what you're going to be bombarded with is negativity around impressions. Your practice doesn't need to be associated with negativity. It needs to be associated with high tech, fun, low stress. Look at these poor patients. This is the reality. Okay, perception is reality. You could fundamentally get rid of impressions right now and go to something that's more comfortable for your patients. I feel bad for these patients. I mean, I hate getting impressions. I feel all claustrophobic. I drool everywhere. It's just, why? It's just not fun, guys. We, we're in a whole new kind of digital age right now. Patients talk about, they talk about it when you scan them and they see their mouth on the screen. That's something they talk about in a positive way. We know from the evidence in the literature that patients unanimously prefer Digital impressions over physical impressions. It's just reality. This is what the research shows, okay? They don't like conventional impressions. I love this. I love that. Right? It's just We're going to have to make an impression of your, your mouth. I've got a little treat for you, Robin. Robin, bring in Stephen Baldwin's, Robin, bring in Stephen Baldwin's for mold for Doug to look at. <laughs> Open wide. All right, now bite down. Oh, okay. Wiggle your nose. Just breathe through your nose, right? Wiggle your toes. Oh, my goodness. You never have to do that again. That's not a reality anymore. And, of course, in dental school, our students are really good at impressions. Look at this. This kid, I almost passed out. This was like one of those clown shows. This impression goes all the way down to the superior sphincter of the stomach. I had to snip it with a scissor. It's like one of those things with a ribbon, you're just pulling it out of your mouth and it keeps coming like we're at the circus. This kid, dude, this kid actually got a hundred though because they got, they captured everything. I could not take off any points anywhere. Best impression I've ever seen. So, all right, joking aside, physical or digital for the accuracy? I think we're completely unfair when we start to compare these two. It's just not right. When, <laughs> let's be real. How do you look at your physical impressions? Unless you're like, I don't know, rock star, prosthodontist, you got your microscope out and, you know, who knows? You're looking at it like that. You're trimming your own dyes and stuff like that. Most dentists snap that thing out of the patient's mouth, hold it 
look at it really quick, put it in the box and send it away and say, pray that the laboratory technician figures out how to deal with it, right? Because the patient's sitting there teary-eyed, looking at you like, did you get it, doctor? And you're like, yeah, it's perfect. But the reality of it is it's terrible. And you know it's terrible. Go to your lab, walk through there, look at the impressions coming in. Probably not yours, right? But everybody else's. They're all terrible. Christensen, landmark study 97, showed that half of all impressions had deficient margins. Margins. That's the most important part. You're like, well, we've come so far since 97. Actually, we're, we haven't at all. If you look at um, the last American impressions from this recent study, showed that 86% had critical errors. Pfft, we're not any better than we used to be. Tons and tons of things that could go wrong. Bubbles, delaminations, voids. We're terrible. Just, just understand that. Laboratory technicians make us look good. Oh, we could go on and on talking about the limitations of impression materials, but let's not do that. Um, let's talk a little bit about digital. Laboratories understand that the digital workflows lead to better fitting internal and marginal of copings and restorations. That's why they're all digital. 90% of them are milling, they're scanning. They're taking your physical impressions and they're literally scanning them into the computer. All right, so I think we need I think we need to talk about accuracy. I think we really do because patients love digital. It, there's an ROI with digital. It's fun to use. It's faster. Laboratories love digital. But who cares if it's not accurate, right? If it's not as accurate as physical, we shouldn't adopt it. Or if it's going to lead to a subpar restoration, we shouldn't adopt it. But you need to understand a little bit about the research regarding digital impressions and as it relates to accuracy, because it's kind of a different type of accuracy. It's trueness and precision related to ISO standard 5725. And we'll talk about that. But the first thing you need to know, and this is unequivocally true, that mesh density has nothing to do with trueness or precision or accuracy at all. So, I could actually hit a button on my computer and turn that triangular mesh pattern into 50 times more triangles if I wanted to. All that does is increase the file size, make it more uh, difficult to render. People are confused. They think that the more points, the better. The, the more mesh, the better. It's not actually reality. Um, this study here uh, by Medina Sotomayor showed that the resolution of the digital impression system has absolutely no relationship with accuracy. Um, this is what's going on in reality. So your scanner is taking points of data, um, numbers really, zeros and ones almost, if you could think of it like that, and you're getting these point clouds of data. Software magically uses these sophisticated algorithms to create triangular mesh, meshes with uh, face groups and normals built in. This is something that is very dependent on the manufacturer's algorithms. They're not using classical algorithms much anymore. They're using proprietary and oftentimes very sophisticated algorithms to turn those point clouds into triangular meshes. And how that happens is what really determines accuracy and margin crispness and detail. Take this study, for example, it looked at triangular mesh density and marginal crispness, okay? What they found is there's no correlation. There's no correlation between the number of triangles and how good the margin looks. In fact, some of the scanners that had the most triangles had the crummiest margin. So let's just get that out of our head. Um, companies might say, well, we take 50 gajillion data points a second and whatever. All that does is make your scanner bigger and bloater, bloatier and, and impossible to render in timely fashion which is why you got to pump it up to the cloud for eight hours and then finally download it for half of these. No, what's really happening and where Plameca has really been leading the way with active triangulation scanning is their stitching algorithms. They've gotten to be the best in the industry and in particular the newest updates that are coming out turn the scanner into just as accurate of a scanner as a confocal scanner but it's half the weight right and it's about one-fifth the size 
So they've been able to do this, and it's been phenomenal to see this evolution. I mean, we never would have thought we would have been able to scan a golf ball five years ago because of the repeated patterns that are hard to stitch together. Now, back to ISO standard 5725, we know that there's precision and trueness. Precision means how repeatable something is. Trueness means how close to reality that object is. Um, when it's scanned, trueness is a much more important number. I don't really care much about precision, although people get all hung up on precision because you could be precisely crappy. You could be precisely bad. Like look at the top right bullseye. You are consistently bad. You are a very precise scanner. That number doesn't really matter to me because trueness, to be a true scanner means, especially in any kind of legitimate research for taking multiple scans, you could be a little bit in the plus, a little bit in the minus deviation on the X, Y, Z scale, but all consistently true. That's the more important number. So I only talk about trueness. It's the only thing that really matters in me. The way that we determine trueness is we take an object, we scan it with like a $300,000 industrial scanner, like the ATOS capsule or ATOS 3, like that object in gold. Then we take our intraoral scanners and we scan our that same object with our intraoral scanners, and then we use sophisticated metrology software like Geometric Control X or Gaumann Spec to simply overlay those two separate and distinct data points based off of sophisticated iterative closest point algorithms that we could then control actually where those ICP algorithms are occurring on that model too using uh, sophisticated zone matching. And what we're going to find is that this software then is going to create a heat map of errors that we could then um, draw some statistics from. And the Emerald S is a phenomenally accurate scanner, okay? They've been working all summer to turn this scanner into the, one of the most accurate scanners on the market today. It's, it's been phenomenal. What you need to know, though, before we get into the weeds of the Emerald S is that all scanners are, the studies that you read are all obsolete, completely obsolete. Um, what I mean by that is it takes two, two years to get something published in the literature. By that time, that scanner would have been through probably about 30 software iterations. And we know, based off of this study that I did, that in two years, you could quadruple the accuracy of a scanner just by software updates. So we've gone to 50 micron accuracy to like a 12 micron accuracy for the same scanner, same person scanning. The other thing that you need to understand when you look at um, studies is that they're all fake, completely fake. They're almost worthless. Don't even read them, actually, to be honest with you. I'll read them for you and tell you. Most studies use completely artificial substrates when they're looking at accuracy, like stone models. When was the last time you scanned stone in your patient's mouth? Who cares, really, how well something scans stone? We know based off of some research that the refractive index of the substrates being scanned dramatically influenced the trueness and precision of that object. So what that means is stone has nothing to do with enamel and dentin and composite and amalgam and zirconia and all the stuff that we scan in our patients' mouths don't correlate to stone. So stop reading studies on stone. And then there's even more ridiculous studies that use cast metal. Hmm. How did that conversation go? Let's cast a metal object and scan it 500 times to determine how accurate we could be. Why? No, that doesn't translate to reality because scanners are specifically engineered to have accuracy within the refractive index range of stuff that we deal with in reality in the mouth. So they're usually calibrated to enamel um, or dentin not metal. So, I mean, unless you're scanning jaws or somebody like that from that has like a metal mouth completely all over, it doesn't really matter. This doesn't really apply. Here's another study. Well intended. Do they take these metal balls and they glue them in the patient's mouth using a custom jig and then they scan the patient and measure the inter-arch distance of the balls. Not surprisingly, they found that like the Omnicam was like 850 microns off. We know the Omnicam's not quite that bad. It's more like a 200 micron scanner. That's uh, not, it's compounding errors because the Omnicam's not designed to scan metal balls. So just, just to say, it's really hard to understand where these people are going with their research. This is the stuff that we scan, you know, core buildup material, composite, you know, enamel and dentin and amalgam and stuff like that. That's what should be studied. So what we do, my team, is we try to be more realistic 
and this happens to be a recently deceased um, human specimen that we separated out the maxilla and we scanned them with the ATOS capsule and the ATOS 3 scanner and all our intraoral impression systems under 5 degrees Celsius, 80% humidity. And we, this is an example of the ATOS capsule that I was at. Once again, the ATOS capsule. So what we found, and there's several publications you could read, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but we found actually that um, number one is scanners are remarkably accurate. Okay. Number two, that it does matter what you're scanning. Okay. So the more translucent the material is, the less accurate the scanner scan. This makes sense because the light is penetrating through the translucent material and then back out and it gets distorted. So here's another thing. All accuracy studies are biased. What I mean by that is, let's just go like this. Scanner company X drops off their scanner at academician Y. Academician Y may have never even used that scanner. They're used to using scanner B. Their whole life they've used scanner B. They've never touched this other scanner. For the very first time, they're gonna use that scanner for research. I even get phone calls from people, um, academicians, and say, hey, I'm doing a research study with scanner X. We can't figure out how to export the scans. I'm like, warning sign. If you don't know how to use the scanner, you should not be researching that scanner. That's ridiculous because we know, we know that the experience of the user dramatically influences how um, accurate that scan will be. And so for our studies, like for example, take this simple case here, same patient, same scanner, two different people scanning. One has experience and one doesn't. The person on the left is, it's going to take them a year to scan this patient. I have no idea what they're doing. I think they might actually be thinking about vacation or something. I have no idea where their mind is at right now. Anyway, let's keep going. This has been tried and true in the literature. It's been proven again and again that experience does matter. Um, and so for our studies, we always have somebody that's been experienced with the scanner for at least a year or that is a key opinion leader for that scanner manufacturer. We don't have like one person scanning for all the scanners because there's no one person that knows how to use all the scanners well. It doesn't exist. That's not reality. So. The other thing is we're always using either real human specimens or custom typodonts that have uh, refractive indexes that are identical to dentin or enamel. So, for example, we have this custom TelioCAD model that has a refractive index of 1.5, which is very similar to dentin, which is 1.54. So, first study that we did with this um, custom model was with sextants, because most general dentists, believe it or not, are scanning just quadrants or sextants. And what we found is that it doesn't really matter how you scan these little things. Go at it however you want, doesn't affect accuracy, and that it's remarkably accurate. We're surpassing that of polyvinyl siloxane for sextants and quadrants. For full arches, it's a little bit different. Um, scan patterns sometimes can matter uh, for particular scanners. This one particular study we showed, we looked at four different scan patterns, and we found that we're about 50 microns cross arch for certain patterns, and that it's still remarkably accurate because if you think about it, uh, polyvinyl siloxane is about 20 microns plus you pour it up in stone, that's another 10. Most laboratories are then scanning that, so you're compounding another 10 to 15 on that. So you're at 50 anyway with uh, most physical impressions because nobody's using your physical impression, they're digitizing it. Okay, back to this study here, it showed no statistical difference between the emerald and the trios three and itero element. So that's really awesome. Of course, Omnicam is off the charts inaccurate. It's just never been a good full arch scanner. Um, don't know why people have been selling it so crazily um, as if it was such a good full arch scanner. Everybody in the research world knows that the Omnicam was one of the worst full arch scanners on planet Earth, which is why they had to come out with the Prime Scan. All right, let's keep uh, trucking along here with the research. Typically, um, active triangulation scanners are a little bit scan pattern dependent. Planmeca has managed to make the Emerald S not scan pattern dependent in our, our recent data. Back to the human maxilla, okay, with the ATOS. We're about 50 microns cross arch here with the Emerald. We are with the Emerald S about 29 microns cross arch. So um, 39 for preparations with the Emerald, once again. 
not different than the other confocal scanners on the market. It's Emerald, it's a triangulation scanner. Soft tissue, we have a human maxilla here that has been separated out and um, we scan them with all the different scanners in the market. Emerald S was at about 100 microns for the soft tissue. So that's phenomenal, guys. It's more accurate than physical, which compressed the tissue about 120 microns. Because we're using light, we don't have to worry as much about tissue compression. Now, this is my latest study using the latest softwares. And we looked at a custom type of dot model with all the different substrates you could fathom. So we had gold, zirconia, amalgam, polished amalgam, different translucencies of composite, of course, enamel and dentin were in there. So we had all these different substrates. And what we found, we did the ATOS scan of it and we compared it. The Emerald S absolutely and utterly killed it in accuracy. And this is after, if you look, look at Emerald S beta. Okay, Emerald S beta is somewhere there in the middle. Phone call to Plemec and say, hey guys, I think you guys could do better. Four months later, they come out with the new software for scanning, which is revolutionary. It's insane, guys. It's in beta. I have NDA signed, so I'm not able to... Um, the new software is just incredible. But... Look at the accuracy of it. So it's it's so accurate. It's the second most accurate scanner here. It's tied with the Itero Element 2, which is which has been known for its cross arch, full arch accuracy for Invisalign, right? So the Emerald S is just a phenomenal scanner, more accurate than the Trios 3. I cannot tell you how proud I am to to, to understand that. This is the kind of company Planmeca is. A phone call then leads to software that makes it one of the world's most accurate scanners. It's phenomenal. Love this company. That's the type of innovations that they do. Now, let's get back to this, how it affects real world. So this is a patient that needs their small one. Look at how fast this scanner tracks, okay? It's insane. This doesn't get lost once. It, we're gonna do a 30 second final impression for six minutes. That would take forever with physical impression material, it's like injected around each tooth and spray it and get everything. This is so easy, guys. I'm basically falling asleep here as I'm scanning this. I'm probably actually doing this complication when I'm scanning this because it's just too easy. Look, 30 something seconds. Let's see how it actually does when we mark our margins here. Look at this. Look at the color. It's so crisp. I have no question in my brain where those margins are. Using a, a ultra high definition color to mark the margins, plus that crisp stone view that Planmeca has been rendering the stone view phenomenally well with the latest version of the software. Guys, this scanner is just, there's nothing better than this scanner for, especially if you consider what else it could do. Like for example, now this is a same day case. I'm gonna mill this in my office. I am copying a diagnostic wax up. Patients approved this diagnostic wax up. Now, you could also copy provisionals. Let's say you wanted to pop some provisional in, work out um, anterior guidance, and then scan that in. You'll copy that down to the micron level with this clone feature that is the most powerful clone feature, I think, out of any company on the planet. Other companies have it, but it's not as powerful. Look at how powerful this is. Look at how fast this is. This is real time. Look at that design. Now we're here sped up two times here. This whole design was a probably a 10 minute design. So we go from this to this same day using that clone feature. Phenomenal. Now, what about single visit, single units, right? So that's what most of you guys are going to want to play with at first, and then you're going to get really bored and want to do some advanced stuff for sure. But single units, boring but easy, right? This system is designed from the ground up, especially if you get the Plan Mecca Mill, the 30S Mill, single visit cannot go wrong with this system, guys. I'm telling you. We're prepping teeth different because we don't have the temp anymore. We're not just mindlessly, arbitrarily churning butter around the tooth, just circumferentially reducing it down to the tissue. We're more thinking about, okay, can I save the buccal and lingual? Maybe I could do more of an onlay, a crown lay, an occlusal overlay type preparation like they used to do with gold all the time, kind of just preserving cusps that don't need to be covered. But what's cool, is when you're scanning and you and you hold still for just two seconds, 
photo is taken, instantly goes into electronic health record, could be sent to insurance. So if you see me pause, I'm taking photos of my preparation to send to insurance. And that's really cool because now I don't have to think about that. I don't need to have an intraoral camera thing that people get. I just have it all in one system. And the photos are ultra high definition. So that's one thing that's really cool. They're magnified too. So very nice. So here we are just scanning in a single unit. This would be considered a D2740. It's a crown. But in, in kind of slang, it's a crown lay. What that means is that you conservatively cover the, the cusps. You're not circumferentially reducing down to the tissue. Okay, you're, you're at the height of contour buccal lingually. So the, the biomimetic guys would say you're preserving the bio rim of that tooth. Um, if you're in the Milicic group, um, the Graham Milicic group, you, you would understand what I'm talking about. It's a phenomenal trend that's going on where people are trying to be more conservative, preserve, preserve that enamel bio rim of the tooth, and really protect the tooth from... Uh, any further degradation down the line with that enamel rim. Okay, so now we're scanning the opposing, now we're gonna scan the bite, and the bites are snapping in gorgeously uh, with the newest iteration of this software, like I said. You can even see it shift as it actively um, adjusts to the, the more data that you give it, it's more accurate of a scan. And so this is the margin mark, and you just scribble really quickly around and it just instantly marks the margin and it's, it gets it really close to reality, even with some sub-G margins like I have there. And now we're off to the races with our design. There's the initial proposal. Huh. I don't have to do much, guys. I'm just basically playing around here. Let's look at the occlusion here. It's perfect. Two little dots on the functional cusps, okay? Instant color map of my material thickness. So I know everywhere circumferentially what my material thickness is. Proximal contacts, I like them tight. There we are. Day of delivery, when you remove that rubber dam, you get that heme, but just a phenomenal scanner. I think nobody comes close to this scanner when you consider the support, the speed, the cost, color, and the accuracy. All those things combined, I think, to make this the best scanner on the market. Now, back to our patients, because that's kind of why we do dentistry, right? We're, we're all about our patients and what matters to them. I think in-office milling is the single biggest practice builder that you could have from the patient perspective and if you know how to do your time management right and you save a ton of time like I do, we're at an hour and a half for hand polish restorations and we're at two hours for um, fired restorations. And that could be whether it's zirconia or um, even if we're doing Emacs, we're, we're going to be roughly about the two hour mark. So let me explain that workflow to you. First, you have to understand though, hands down, not having the patient back for setting up the room again, having to worry about, do I need to do an anesthesia again? Temps falling off, emergencies for that, patients not having to come back and take another day off of work. That, that whole thing has been sold to you guys for so many years though, I feel like you're numb to it. You're just like, well, whatever, same day, it's not cool. I just want to scan and send it off. You're missing out. Um, there's nothing that's been a bigger practice builder for me than milling in office. It's just like lens crafters. I, you want to go get your glasses. You don't want them shipped to you in, in four weeks. You want them there, milled right there in the office. Because what you fail to understand from the patient perspective, how much do you spend on marketing a year? I mean, this is the biggest marketer. Patients don't like to come to see you. As much as they pretend, they hate you actually. It's sad. They would rather, based on this USA example, they would rather go to the DMV than come to see you. They would rather do their taxes at the DMV than to come see you. So why would you think it's cool to set up follow-up visits for their crown? So you have them come back for delivery. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. High five. We'll wiggle off your tent. We'll numb you up a few times again. We'll, you know, it's going to be awesome. We'll adjust the crown because who knows how good it's going to be. No, guys, in-office milling is a game changer. And the best mill, I could confidently say, is the 30S mill. We've been testing it for over a year, and it has not failed us once. We have not had to call customer support once on this mill. It's an open mill. It means you can mill any STL file. You have to mill some Yodas for your kids. They're phenomenal. We're milling these whisper thin veneers that are 300 microns thick. These veneers are paper thin. Because it uses a unique milling motor technology that doesn't chatter, 
we're able to mill these things. It's a direct drive linear motors. These linear force motors are industrial grade motors, not like motors on other chair side mills, like these Fisher Price mills that have like these servo motors. Um, we're milling clear restorations. This is just a no pre prep case here. Um, day of delivery, phenomenal um, mill, guys. And then when you have an office mill, you could do cool stuff. Like this patient came in for a consult. Said, I'm missing a tooth. I don't want to implant. I don't know what to do. Can you do a bridge or something? I'm like, dude, you're here for 30 minutes. Let's scan you in. Let's design you a little tooth and glue it in. So here's an uh, adhesion bridge, a one-wing adhesion bridge, which those of you guys don't know, one wing is always better success than two. Yeah, look at some original work by Dr. Yamashita out of Japan. The one-wing adhesion bridge is phenomenal. One little block, 28 bucks, 10 minutes in the 30s mill, 30 minute appointment, and I have delivered this guy his one wing adhesion bridge. It's so cool. I mean, this type of dentistry, look at how much that blends in right there. It makes me look like a hero. An open mill means I can mill anything from any design, from anywhere, from any lab. I'm partnering with a lot of um, abutment manufacturers to, to manufacture their custom abutment and send me their, we'll talk about that, their custom crown, screwmentable crowns that I can mill. I'm milling these pre-surgical temporaries based off of my surgical guide plan that I'm pre-manufacturing these provisionals ready to go on the day of surgery. So um, <clears throat> we're able to not have to worry about that. Guys, I don't know. I can do one all day. Screwmentable crowns. We're milling holes in our crowns. Whew. Just love this thing. Look at it. It's just a beauty. I put my GoPro in there. Just let her sing to me. It's phenomenal. Guys, ooh, look at that fit. Can somebody explain to me how that's even possible? Can you even better that anywhere? No, negative. You're not going to better that. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. What's nice, guys? The accuracy of this mill surprised us. We just finished up a study where we did micro CT analysis of um, crowns manufactured with this mill and then comparing it to the MCXL mill where you looked at absolute, absolute marginal discrepancy as described by Holmes at all. And what we found, and by the way, AMD, absolute marginal discrepancy is a bigger number than marginal gap because AMD takes in consideration horizontal and vertical marginal discrepancy and combines them with the hypotenuse of that angle. And what you're going to find here is alarming. Same tooth, same material. The 30S mill is half the gap as the MCXL mill. <laughs> let, me, let me just, maybe I could rephrase that. The 30S mill is killing it with marginal accuracy. It's the most accurate mill that we've tested. Phenomenal. All right, now, why in office milling? Again, you know, <clears throat> It's having that complete control for me. I used to dread single unit anteriors. This lateral incisor would freak me out. I would send photos, I would worry about it. With in-office milling, the materials we have to mill are so beautiful and gorgeous. They make you look like a hero. Your patients are gonna see that you're an artist, even if you're not. They're gonna think you're a hero because you could deliver stuff like this with very little skill involved. And you could make yourself, just patients are like, oh, my doctor, he custom, Painted, he hand painted his this tooth for me and made it so I can't even tell which one it is. Patients talk about this stuff. Let your patient put the block in the mill. For goodness sakes, just let them do that. It's just phenomenal. Oh my goodness, how far have we come, guys? Take this case, for example. We have some two butter bean composites. People love to play with plastic. I have no idea why. But let's go ahead and turn these into some ceramics. You could customize the ceramic however you want. In this particular case, the patient said, I don't want people to know I have my two fronts. I want them to blend in with my fluorosis. And he's, he's done, right? Like I said before, guys, more conservative preps, one millimeter reduction everywhere, just like we used to do with gold, keeping the margin high and dry, just overlaying cusps. We're using these preps as standard of care. This crown laid prep right here is my standard full coverage prep. Look at this thing. Your dental school professor would be crying real tears, probably kick you out of the building if they knew that you were even remotely considering prepping something like this, but you preserve circumferentially the enamel. Next time you do a crown prep, usually it's like got a large MOD amalgam with some cracks and you're worried about the cusps popping. Take a look at the buccal and lingual. Why are you, why are you hurting the buccal and lingual for no reason? It hasn't done anything to you. 
just cover what needs to be covered and protect what needs to be protected. Just a totally phenomenal philosophy. We've been doing these for 10 long years. This is this one is literally 10 years ago. Um, margin in the, at the height of contour, there it is delivered. You can't even see it. Where did it go? <laughs> awesome. Here's one, the 70 year recall. I'm gonna show you guys. Um, there it is, the day of delivery right there. Here we are on the radiograph. There is no margin. You can't see it. Seven year recall. I like this because it's high and dry. I could feel it. I could look at it. I could see it. The patient could brush it. You're not like feeling below the gums for some margin somewhere. Then the next thing you know, it's all bombed out because of whatever, because that's the dirtiest spot of the, the mouth is at the CEJ down there. Why do you keep putting stuff in the dirtiest part of the mouth? The other thing that you need to understand is Plymaca has tons of implant workflows. Um, any, because we're open, any STL file, any core file could be brought in, an Atlantis core file could be brought in, and I could mill that, I can mill custom um, crowns for custom abutments, I could mill screw retain crowns. I'm happy to show you True Abutment workflow right now. True Abutment is uh, a big abutment manufacturer in the United States, and they will actually let you do their whole workflow for about 200 bucks which is like less than a ceramic tie base and all the little pieces that you need and all that for that crummy thing. So basically, this is the workflow. You buy a true abutment scan body that's autoclavable and reusable. It has a titanium base to it. And you scan first the soft tissue without the abutment in, okay? So here we are now, this is just the soft tissue. Scanning the quadrant, making sure I get all that detail worked out. want to get a cross arch a little bit for occlusal stability, okay? So here we are, filling in all that data. Now, make sure you get your proximal contact there. It's often forgotten. It's right there, because that's actually going to be used to design that crown later on. Now, we're going to copy that file. It automatically copies down to the scan body tab. Erase any flash that you have from tongue or whatever. Screw in your scan body, take a check radiograph to make sure it's down, and then scan away. You only have to scan the scan body. The rest has already been scanned. It's been duplicated. <clears throat> so now you're going to scan your scan body, and check and make sure we have a little bit of um, opening there on the lingual. So unlike a physical impression where you have to then look at it and say, oh, trash it, start all over, sorry Mrs. Jones, Another three minutes of the rubber in your mouth. <clears throat> With the digital, all you do is erase a little and put the camera back in 30 seconds later, that's done. It wasn't even 30 seconds. Now we have a gorgeous scan of that scan body. Then we're gonna scan the opposing <clears throat> and we're gonna scan the bite. The opposing, you just need the occlusals and the buckles. The linguals, you don't really need the linguals. Why would you need the linguals? Don't waste your time scanning the labels. It's just a waste of time. So in 10 seconds, we scan the opposing. And now we're going to capture um, the bite. Okay, now you could do two bites. You could do um, one bite. It depends on how big of a case you're doing and whether you want open bite or central relation. Here we're just doing MIP. So we're going to scan that in. <clears throat> now, this data gets sent to True Abutment. Pick your manufacturer X, Y, or Z. It could be anybody. It doesn't have to be True Abutment. I happen to like True Abutment, so I use them a lot. They will, within 24 hours, send you a shot of the abutment design, custom abutment design. Okay. They will then send you a shot of the crown design. For 200 bucks, you're going to get your custom abutment mailed to you. They're going to digitally send you that design that you could then mill in your mill in office. So you can mill that yourself with the hole in it for 28 bucks for the block cost. Let's just say $3 for the burrware. It's really like 31 to 35 by when it's all said and done. So maybe you're 235 all in on the cost. It depends on, on how you do the math. I was paying almost 600 bucks for a custom abutment with a screw retaining crown. So here we are all in for like 228, 230. That's insane. So now with the lab, what they'll do is they'll send you that STL file. You'll import it in. Just It's called like import from milling. It's so easy. It automatically brings you to here. 
and you're just going to send that to the mill and mill it. It's going to be perfect. I did, in one week, I milled six of these suckers. Look at how much I saved. So 560 bucks was what I was paying. So, so that would have been $3,300 lap bill. Just by doing it this digital workflow way, by doing it in-house in one week, I saved over two grand. So like, <laughs> it's just a no-brainer, guys. Then let's not even talk about surgical guides. And I mean, we could go down the rabbit hole of what we could do with Plameca. We know that surgical guides are the standard of care. I really do feel like they are. I mean, you could the evidence in the literature shows that freehanding is going to lead to profound errors. Surgical guides are not. So, I mean, whether or not you want to legally label it as standard of care or just kind of accept the fact in the back of your mind that it's a new standard of care, I think you just need to understand, forget about all that stuff. What's better for the patient? We know that if you freehand, you're 88% likely to have an error. Where if you use a guide, you're only 6% likely to have an error. We know that if you do something guided, it's significantly less intraoperative and postoperative sensitivity and pain for your patient. That's, that's reason enough alone. Forget the accuracy part. Just the fact that my patients recover faster is enough for me to switch to something. Um, here we are, Mary, um, our, our rock star dental assistant that we have. She's, she's awesome. Scanning one of our patients here. Um, that's Dr. Evans, who's rock star periodontist that we have. The Romexa Surgical Guide Suite, so simple. You just pick three common data points between your intraoral scan and your CBCT. It automatically interdigitates those together using very good matching algorithms. Over 200 implants are in the library database. Many of them have the manufacturer's sleeves all pre-recorded, so you just hit the button and it's all done for you. This is the easiest to use surgical guide software ever invented anywhere. It's, this is it right here. This is the surgical guide module. You circle the area you want the guide to fit, and within a couple seconds, it's instantly rendered, and you're ready to 3D print it. You trim the flash off, now you can print it, pop in your sleeve, you're ready to go. The whole appointment takes like 15 minutes to do the actual surgery. It's saving so much chair time that you could do a full arch, fully guided, in 30 minutes and have the prosthetic pre-made to all screw in. It's just phenomenal, the precision that you get. It's, it's just an awesome workflow. Um, the CBCT is a workhorse CBCT. We've had one for eight years, taking 20 images a day, and it has never once gone down. You can't make that stuff up. This is phenomenal. I mean, this is, everybody knows that the Plymeca CBCTs are the most robust CBC, CBCT machines on the planet. I mean, it's made out of some type of Valerian steel, Finnish steel. It's man, handmade in Finland. And those guys have such attention to detail. I, I have no doubt that these things are going to last forever. More importantly, though, they pioneered the ultra low dose protocols. They're the most effective ULD on the market without decreasing quality of the scan. So we could do full jaw scans, 14 microsieverts. That's phenomenally low, guys, just as a reference. Uh, 40 microsieverts for a full mouth and 30 for a pano. Um, definitely something that we could be confident and comfortable doing for our patients using the CBCT scan. So let's just go through one case and then we're gonna wrap it up for the day because we're totally out of time and I wish I could keep going. But here's a patient, super awesome patient. PTSD, GERD, um, neurogenic bruxer, airway issues, no idea where his teeth belong in his face. So the first thing I want to do is throw him into Planmeca smile design software. Planmeca has some phenomenal smile design software. This software is so easy. I'm going to just, in two dimensions, I got his face, his midline, his inner pupillary line, retracted and smile shots all merged together. I'm going to figure out where I need to put his teeth in his smile. Then I'm going to take the 2D silhouette, merge it with the 3D scan that I took of in his mouth, and I'm going to start sculpting his teeth so that I know where the implants go in the bone. Otherwise, I have no idea. And so this is just kind of overlaying his two-dimensional silhouette of, of his 3D now um, smile, and we're sculpting this stuff. 
this is taking into consideration everything, his face, his midline, his smile line. Now I'm merging, just with three clicks, the intraoral scan to the CBCT. This is a ULD CBCT at 200 micron resolution. And now I am going to bring in that wax up that I just did. It's all in the software, it's all instant. Look at this, placing my implants, I have complete control here over the sleeve location, the total drill length. Um, if I didn't want to do mathematics, I could do an automated way and have Plymeca Romexis determine the sleeve height for many different implants. It's fully um, autonomous, like Strawman and BioHorizons and Implant Direct. All those companies have it all preloaded in. Uh, Camlog. So now we're doing implant centric view rotations. This is the surgical guide process right here, guys. A click, that guide is nearly done. I'm just trimming away a little bit of the flash there. Look at how easy that is. Guys, this thing is gonna print for like 10 bucks. Sur surgery is a 30 minute procedure. There's no better ROI in dentistry. Um, and it's no, there's no lower stress. I've already done it on the computer. I don't have to flap the patient in this instance. Patient doesn't even understand why they took off work that day. This guy literally called me and said, hey, uh, <laughs> why did you suggest that I take off work? I haven't felt a thing. There it is. Day of surgery, snap that sucker in, cross arch stabilization. These things fit butter smooth. Look at that thing, there's no rock to it. It's fully seated. <clears throat> Everything is through the guide. Um, the osteotomies and the actual implant placement is all through the guide. So here we are going through the different um, osteotomy protocols here. And what's nice is because we know where the implants are going to be located, we can have a pre-surgical prosthetic ready to go, 3D printed, ready to go with the holes already cut in them to pick up on our temp cylinders. So I want to show you guys that and it's going to be exactly based off of the wax up, based off of the smile design. So there's no adjustments that are going to be needed for aesthetics here. So now we're placing these implants here. Like I said, guys, 30 minutes for the whole appointment here. It's sped up um, probably a five minute video here, but in real time, it's a 30 minute process. <clears throat> patient is not sedated because we're finding that we have to sedate less and less because we're doing these things guided. So we, you know, little pinholes. Implant through the osteotomy site, through the sleeve, um, and that's depth controlled based off of the notch on the um, driver, on that implant driver. So everything is fully guided here and because, like I said, because of that, we're depth control. We have everything ready to go. We could wiggle out those remaining three teeth that were prepped. Now, if we didn't get torque, we could put back a temporary on those teeth. Now, we got torque, so we could go ahead and deliver this 3D printed prosthetic, which is going to be identical to the smile design. Check this out. Look at that. This is the power of an all-in-one software that I think is just completely forgotten. Nobody really understands that we could actually spend all day going through Smile Design, Surgical Guide Suite, um, the Model Analyzer, the Model Builder, 3D Ortho, everything from Planmeca is phenomenal. Nobody really knows about it. Uh, anyway, stay tuned for some more stuff on that, but thanks guys, and I hope you stuck with me to the end here.